All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we are very excited to have Helen Byrne today. Um, Helen is a professor from the Mathematical Institute at University of Oxford. Her research focuses on the development and analysis of mathematical and computational models that describe biochemical biomedical systems with particular application to the growth and treatment of solid tumors, wound healing, and tissue engineering. So today she will share with us some of the related work about multi-scale approaches for analyzing vascular networks. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you. Um, I wish we were meeting in person, but I think this is a good second best. Um, and thank you. Um, I hope you enjoy um, the talk. Um, please do feel free to ask questions if anything is unclear. Um, and please do tell me, because I'm conscious that it's your lunch time. You can give me a five minute warning as necessary, so I won't be offended. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is just really going to be a whistle stop tour through work that I've been involved with over the last um, probably 25 years. Um, and just to give you a flavour really of the different mathematical approaches that we use in mathematical biology and how our tools that we use have really evolved during that period in many ways guided by the increasing availability of um, really beautiful biological data. But um, just before I begin, I guess probably should talk a little bit about um, angiogenesis in particular, because that will, I think, be the main focus of today's talk. So angiogenesis is basically the process by which new blood vessels form um, from pre-existing vessels. Now that, that can happen in wound healing. It's a hallmark of tumors where um, if they um, outstrip the nutrient that's supplied by the host vessels, they will secrete different growth factors or angiogenic factors that will diffuse through the surrounding tissue. Um, when they come into contact with neighboring blood vessels, they will stimulate the endothelial cells that line those blood vessels to form sprouts, as you can see here. The endothelial cells will also proliferate and migrate by chemotaxis towards the source of the diffusible angiogenic factors. As they grow, you'll find that capillary sprouts will form fused together or anastomose, and that will form a connected loop through which blood can flow. And in that way, you can increase the supply of oxygen to um, whatever tissue it is. So as I've said, angiogenesis is a hallmark of very many different biological processes. In tumors, it's undesirable. We can also see it happening in um, the retina. Um, and I guess also in wound healing where it's nicely regulated, but there's a host of other diseases where angiogenesis is implicated, either because it occurs when we don't want it, or because it doesn't occur adequately. So for example, in certain types of um, chronic wounds, wounds that won't heal. Um, and I guess the other side to that is um, because it's um, characterized with a whole host of different diseases, there's an awful lot of interest in trying to um, target um, angiogenesis or the, the mechanisms that contribute to it um, for, for different treatment strategies. So just to give you a sort of sense of the importance of studying angiogenesis. So from a mathematical point of view, I guess there's a whole host of different ways in which one might try to um, study or model the process of angiogenesis. Um, and what I want to do today is really talk you through some of those different approaches and in particular how they're related to one another. And I sort of highlighted the ones where I'm going to focus. Um, I'm going to start with some really very simple PDE phenomenological models of angiogenesis, then look at discrete models with a view then to coarse graining those and trying to do comparisons between the different modeling frameworks. And then at the end, I'll conclude 
by just trying to bring you more up to date with how we're trying to um, use um, different sort of techniques to try and quantify real biological data on vascular networks from um, tumours. So that's really a rough outline of the talk. And I guess to start with, I will just introduce, as I mentioned, a very simple phenomenological model of angiogenesis. So as promised. So this model dates back before, well, some many years ago, before I suspect many of you were even born, but um, there we go. Um, so the idea here it's a continuum model. If you imagine the cartoon that's shown in the figure of a um, vascular network, we can see the red cells are forming the main body of this blood vessels. And we have um, the blue cells, if you like, are the um, tip endothelial cells, which are following a source of our angiogenic factor, which is here called vascular endothelial fat growth factor. So this is the diffusible species that serves as a signal which stimulates the endothelial cells to migrate by chemotaxis towards that source and also to proliferate um, to create the new cells that we need to grow our new vessel network. So if you imagine this is the schematic of the network that you might see in vivo, if you try and average in the transverse direction, um, perpendicular to the direction of migration, then we might form average um, quantities representing, say, an average tip cell density, the blue cells, an average vessel density, that's the red cells, and we have um, a continuum field representing the concentration of the diffusible species that's guiding the movement, proliferation, etc., of our emerging vascular network. So from a phenomenological point of view, the sort of model that one might write down is as follows. So as I mentioned, we have three dependent variables, our angiogenic factor that diffuses, it has natural decay, rate lambda naught, and it might also be consumed by the endothelial cells as they migrate by chemotaxis towards the source of the angiogenic factor. So that's the first equation. Um, the tip cells are responding to this chemical field. They will undergo random motion, although that will be a fairly secondary effect. They will undergo chemotaxis, moving up spatial gradients in this chemical field. Um, they may proliferate, or we will. So this term here is a source of new. Um, capillary tips which are emerging from existing vessels. So the, de the, the variable rho is representing the vessel density. So you can think of this term alpha naught a rho as modeling the emergence of a new tip from pre-existing vessels. We can also have new tips say bifurcating from pre-existing tips and we assume that um, so the capital H here is the heavy side step function. And what that's saying is where the gradient of this angiogenic factor exceeds a threshold value, a hat, then we can see secondary tips forming from existing tips. So you can think of that as a tip bifurcating into two tips. Equally, we can have loss of tips if they come into contact with either another vessel or but neglected in this case, you could also have cases where two tips come into contact that would give you a quadratic loss term, say beta, beta hat n squared, but we've neglected that here. You can easily include it if you want to. So that's the sort of PDE that we might write down to describe how the tip cells evolve. Um, and then finally, we um, have um, a PDE that describes how the blood vessels that are laid down, and you can think of this, so these phenomenological models are called snail trail models. And the idea there is really, as these um, tip cells migrate forwards towards the set source of the angiogenic factor, they lay behind um, new 
endothelial cells or blood vessels. So the rate at which new vessels are laid down is essentially equal to um, the flux. There's a source term which is proportional to the flux of the tip cells. So the flux associated with random motion and chemotaxis is just mu dndx minus chi n dadx. So we have a source term in here, um, which is essentially new vessels being laid down. Essentially, it's a bit as like if with Hansel and Gretel, when you're walking down a path, you leave another cell behind you, and that's what makes the vessel. So that's the idea of this snail trail. And then the gamma rho term in the vessel equation is just a slow remodeling um, of those blood, blood vessels. So that's a really simple phenomenological model. Question is, how well does it perform? And here's just the typical simulation. So what we see, so time runs from Sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, from top left through one, two, three, as the numbers indicate. And you can see, so initially we start with a tissue devoid of any angiogenic factor. We have our blood vessels on the right hand side. The um, angiogenic factor, which is being produced on the left hand side, quickly diffuses and establishes um, a profile across the tissue. The endothelial tip cells migrate by chemotaxis up spatial gradients in this um, diffusible um, field. And as they migrate out, they bring with them the snail trail of blood vessels, which are shown in blue. So you can see how very quickly the profile of the angiogenic factor settles to what looks almost like a steady state. It doesn't change very much, but you can see this tip of um, or this profile of endothelial red endothelial cells migrating in response to that field across towards the source of the angiogenic factor. Um, sorry, this was I went too far. That was um, so. It, if we have a case of successful angiogenesis, you you can see that as the um, tip cells migrate out then they bring a snail trail of um, new blood vessels behind them. So this would be an example where the number of tip cells increases as they migrate towards the source of the angiogenic factor. And we see a clear profile of um, blood vessels coming behind. So this would be an example of successful angiogenesis. And again, we can manipulate the parameters and you can, if, in one particular case here, if we increase the rate at which that angiogenic factor decays. So it's, it's hardly discernible, but the gradient particularly here is much lower. And what you can see is that, so this is the same time scale, the um, endothelial tip cells do much less well. They actually don't, aren't able to penetrate and we have a much weaker response and we would call this failed angiogenesis. So this is a very old, very simple, model. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through. It's possible if you want to do some analysis and to kind of um, deduce results about the dynamics of the behavior. So for example, you can see in these profiles, there's a maximum in the tip cells. You can also see um, a maximum in the vessel density, and you can prove things um, about the way in which this the solutions evolve, for example, that the um, front of new tip cells accelerates, etc. If you're interested, then please um, go and look in, in the paper from 1995. Hopefully the uh, reference is on the earlier slide and should be at the end of the talk. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I will just um, move on. Um, so, the point for introducing the simple phenomenological model was really so that you could understand um, how a simple model behaves and how it might capture some of the essence of what we see in angiogenesis. And really, I wanted to show you that so that then we can compare it with a 2D discrete model. So as I said, the 1D model was just developed completely sort of from first principles. Um, back in those days, we didn't do so much discrete models. Um, even solving PDEs was sometimes a bit of a challenge. So now 
we obviously have much better computers and we can do much more um, discrete types of stochastic models. So a natural question then is to ask how well does this phenomenological model perform if we compare it with a 2D discrete type of model? Um, and so that's what we'll talk about next. So the idea here is we have a 2D domain, uh, a regular lattice, and we impose some chemical um, field. So that's like our angiogenic factor that will vary with position. In fact, it will just be a linear profile of X. And we um, have our endothelial cells situated on this lattice. They will perform a biased random walk. So with a certain probability, they will move from a lattice site, say X, Y, they can move north, south, east and west. And the probabilities which, with, with which they move in each of those directions is a combination of random motion, but also the biased random walk is detecting. So the cells will sense the difference between the concentration of the chemoattractant at the site that they want to jump to and how that differs from the other site. So you can build, um, you can determine what the probabilities for movement to each of the adjacent sites in this um, von Neumann neighborhood, I guess. You assign, compute the probabilities, and in that way, we can sort of evolve the positions of our tip cells um, on each step of our or iteration of our agent base, based model. So we use this biased random walk to um, determine the way in which the um, endothelial tip cells at the front of a capillary sprout, so the blue cells here, if you like, how they move on this lattice. And as they move, then obviously different events can happen. So things that can happen is this this tip cell might branch into two, and there's a certain probability that that can happen. A tip cell may come into contact with another vessel, a sprout and form an anastomosis. So then you might see a loop or two tips might come together. So we can update the model, um, check whether or not these events are happening um, and update the network um, in such a way. And if you're interested, the reference, there's a reference there for you with, which has got more details. So if we use, implement those rules, then typical sorts of networks that we can get are, a typical network is shown in these um, series of snapshots. So as I mentioned, so the network is moving from left to right in this case, we are imposing a linear chemoattractant field and we seed a number of sprouts on the right hand side I'm sorry on the left hand side at t equals zero and we just see how it evolves over time and this is one such realization obviously and you can see how over time the network is is remodeling we see different loops forming and um, you can see how the shape of the network is changing over time now we can um, obviously, if we average over multiple realizations, then we can generate sort of maps as shown, um, well, in particular shown on the two top panels here. So the panel on the left hand side is showing you the average tip cell distribution at a particular time point over averaged over a thousand realizations. And the panel on the right hand side is showing you the blood vessels that are um, generated behind those migrating tip cells. And at the bottom, what we've done is show you sort of analogous simulation results from our deterministic snail trail PDE model, the phenomenological model that I mentioned before. And I hope you can see that um, there's um, good agreement in the distributions of the tip cells. However, what's happening with the um, vessel density, there seems to be a bit of a discrepancy. And indeed the next simulation, this is just showing you if we average in the transverse direction, so integrate with respect to Y, so we get show the variation in the tip cells and the stalk cells 
for the phenomenological model and the output from our um, agent-based model, you can see that there's good agreement between for the tip cells, but when we look at the vessels that are um, extruded behind those tip cells, the vessel density, there's a strong discrepancy between our phenomenological model and um, the results from the agent-based model. Okay, so the continuum model is underestimating what the true vessel density from the ABM is, is generating. So question is, what, why is that happening and can we correct for it? And it turns out that we can. And um, so what we effectively do, so this is just a restatement of the snail trail phenomenological model that I pr presented a moment ago, but really I want to draw your attention to this corrective factor. So as I mentioned, the idea of the snail trail is as the tip cells move, then we lay down a trail of blood vessels behind them. And in the original snail trail, it was assumed that the constant proportionality was sort of one, okay? Um, and so the rate of production was just proportional to the flux of the um, tip cells. What I want to do now is to introduce a corrective factor that tries to take account of, um, well, look a little bit more carefully at what's actually happening in our 2D ABM and why the phenomenological model is sort of underestimating things. And really, it's quite simple when, when you see what, what we did. So in truth, as I mentioned before, when we have our endothelial tip cells moving, we have probabilities of each of them moving north, south, east and west, and there are different probabilities. Now, when we run our model a thousands over multiple realizations, on each realization, a cell will move in one of these directions. When it does that, then it will lay down some new vessel. Now, when we write down the source term in the continuum, the phenomenological model, we just to take, in fact, the resultant net, we take the modulus of um, the net flux term. Now, in practice, when we do multiple realizations, we will have contributions from each of these different directions. So when we look at the magnitude, then we're actually underestimating the real um, uh, source that's being laid down. So it turns out that what we can, you can use a corrective factor. And again, this is explained in one of the papers by um, a current PhD student, Duncan Martinson. And essentially what we do, so here mu is related to the diffusion coefficient of the endothelial cells. Um, and if we scale that source term in our vessel density equation in this way, then what you will see is we can get really good agreement between the predictions from the um, phenomenological model um, and our agent-based model. And um, I won't show you the results, but this um, sort of correction term generalizes very nicely to when we look at 2D models. And the details are in the reference that's on the slide there for you. Okay, so just to summarize what we done so far is I've tried to introduce to you a very simple phenomenological model of angiogenesis. And then we've shown how that reproduces qualitatively the dynamics of a discrete agent-based model. But what we found is that there's a discrepancy between the rate at which um, the endothelial cells are laying down new blood vessels. But when we look and consider how we might um, the way in which the ABM is working and the assumptions in the phenomenological model, then we can correct for the discrepancy and actually recover good agreement. So I guess it shows you how with the passage of time, you can build a very good, simple phenomenological model. It does the right qualitative behavior. But as we start to think of using models to fit them to data, these sorts of discrepancies can become very important when you're trying to make predictions. And in particular, trying to, I guess, um, estimate the effect, say, of different um, 
treatments that might be designed to either promote angiogenesis or to inhibit it. So it's important, I guess, that we have quantitative agreement between model simulations and um, the biology, or here, I guess, our ABM is being a playing as a surrogate for what might be happening experimentally or in vitro. Okay, so um, moving on then. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've, we've just looked at comparing a phenomenological model, which was just built from first principles, with a discrete model. Now, that then begs the question, why don't we just try to coarse grain our agent base model? And if we do that, how will that model compare with our original phenomenological model? And I guess we were sort of thinking that they should look pretty much the same. So I want to just um, talk you through how what happens when we try to coarse grain the agent based model that I just showed to you and to compare it with the very simple phenomenological model. So this is the picture that we've already seen. It's exactly the same agent based model, bias random walk, cells moving in um, response to um, a prescribed chemoattractant, branching anastomosis, et cetera, et cetera, all at play. Um, now, I'm going to just talk you through the methodology. I'm going to spare you the details. If you're interested, please look at the paper or, or we, can, we can talk about it at the end of the talk. So the idea for how we coarse grain, so we have our 2D um, agent-based model. We can then, from that, the rules that we in, implement in the ABM, we can form a master equation where we have transition probabilities based on the rules that we use in the ABM. We can then take a mean field approximation and derive um, a continuum model PDE description of our tip cells and endothelial cell densities. In order to generate a 1D continuum model that replicates what we had in the phenomenological model, effectively what we do is just integrate in the transverse direction. So perpendicular to the direction in which our um, new blood vessels are migrating, very much as we did with the agent base model. And so what I'm going to do in a moment is just show you the resulting PDEs that we get if we do all of, all of those steps. Um, and so here are the equations. Um, and much of this probably looks very similar or parts of it look similar to what we had with the phenomenological model. So N is our tip cells and here E is the, the vessel density and capital C is our angiogenic factor, which is prescribed. So we see random motion, we see chemotaxis, these are the terms which are modulating. You can think of those as being sort of like volume exclusion terms. So it's saying that if a lattice site is occupied by another cell, then there's a sort of it's difficult for it to move in there. So that those sorts of AN and AE terms are depending on whether we account for volume exclusion when our cells uh, and our tip cells are migrating. We can also see branching terms. Um, and anastomosis very much as we saw with the phenomenological model. The big surprise for us was the form of the vessel density equation, which doesn't look anything like the snail trail that we saw before, which if you remember was just the modulus of the flux term. So here, predominantly the dominant term is just a proliferation term, which is proportional to the tip cell density. So um, the various constants that we get from taking our uh, uh, master equation and then taking meal mean field limit, these are all defined for you at the bottom of the slide there. But certainly at leading order, what we see is this source term, which is just proportional to the um, um, cell density. And then there are other secondary terms and then um, secondary, I guess, movement terms, uh, secondary source terms arising from random motion and um, chemotaxis. Um, and I guess um, 
So this was quite surprising and we were sure that we'd done something wrong, but indeed uh, it is correct. Um, and I guess um, sort of as one sanity check, what we're showing here is just some simulation results where we've taken the phenomenological PDE model and the snail trail PDE model and the PDE equations that I've just shown you. And you can see that there's pretty good agreement between these two. And this was very, very surprising. Um, now, I should say this is only for certain parameter regimes. So there's a question of, of how is it that you two sets of PDEs that look so, so different, how can they possibly give you such beautifully um, nice agreement when, when we try to solve them? And it turns out that if we look at the choice of parameter values that we were using, which correspond to a situation, I don't want you to read this too carefully, um, really just listen to the basic principles. And then if you're interested, you can go to the papers for the details. So if we consider a, um, a parameter regime in which cell movement is dominated by chemotaxis and in which um, the vessels branch at a very low rate, then that corresponds to a certain asymptotic regime. So diffusion is um, subdominant to chemotaxis. So that would mean if we, if we look at this ratio here, this will be a small parameter and um, the ratio of, I think, branching to proliferation, can't remember the details. This is another small parameter. If we make this these assumptions in our governing equations, um, then it turns out that the two, the snail trail phenomenological PDE model and our coarse grained master equation mean field limit, um, we can make these assumptions and rescale them in terms of these small and small parameters. And um, this is what we arrive at. So U is a rescaled um, tip cell density, W is the vessels. So if you look at, say, first of all, look at the equation for W, that's the vessel density, you'll see that at leading order, we have dW by d tor is U, modulus of U, right? Likewise, over on um, the right-hand side, it turns out that we need to do a little bit more work um, um, it, it will turn out that you will get exactly the same um, behavior. I think what one has to do in here is we scale. So alpha in here is small. So at leading order, alpha is small, and in particular such that alpha squared over epsilon is a small parameter. Imagine alpha being epsilon or smaller. So at leading order in the... Um, sort of master equation coarse grained model, we recover the same limit that dwd tor at leading order is proportional to u, okay? And in the same way you can go through, there's a little bit more work to be done, but what we find, um, just to summarize, is that at leading order, both PDEs reduce to the same PDEs the same coupled pair of PDEs. You can do a little bit more work and look at what happens at small times, et cetera, and construct um, explicit solutions, but I'll spare you the details. But certainly what we can find is that under certain assumptions, the good agreement that we were seeing in our numerics was really because the dominant behavior in both models was exactly the same. And here's just another set of results with a different set of parameters just to reinforce the good agreement that we see between. Um, so these are using sort of our asymptotics, the leading order solution that we get from the asymptotics, the full um, model from the snail trail, the phenomenological model. And again, you can see excellent agreement for the tip cells and also for the vessels. So I'm sorry, I, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just had a question. Yes, absolutely. So the correction factor you told us about earlier that uh, enters into your PDE model, presumably this coarse screening would also be a way to find that out yes. directly. Is that yeah. the case? 
Yes. So I guess what when we're using the snail trail model here, we're using that correction factor. But when we've derived the coarse grained model, we've just gone directly from the from the ABM. If, if that makes sense. Before the phenomenological model came before, it had nothing really, it hadn't been sort of developed specifically for the ABM. The PDE model here, this horrible looking one, with all these, these terms here, a different source term at leading order, those have come directly from the ABM. The phenomenological model was just phenomenological ab initio. Mm -hmm. Presumably by comparing those terms and looking at the prefactors that... Yes, uh, yes. So that's exactly what we've done with the asymptotics, really. Yes. And what we found is under certain regimes, and in particular, the reg one regime where they're, they're spot on, is exactly the limit that we've been looking at, where chemotaxis was dominant, which is typically what you would expect, and where branching is negligible. Now, in other regimes where that is not the case, then the agreement is off. So really what this is saying to us is that phenomenological model is good qualitatively and with a corrective correction factor quantitatively in those regimes. So if that's the biology that you're seeing, the phenomenological model is good enough. If you're in a situation where branching is very important, maybe chemotaxis is being inhibited, then it might not be so good. Does that make sense? Good, thank you. And thank you for asking. Um, I'd rather that you ask and understand. Brill. Right, um, how am I doing for time? Um, okay, so blah, blah, blah. So I guess to summarize, and I've, I've already sort of mentioned this, the point, of this exercise was to show you one, how we are now in a position to use the ABM to generate a new um, set of PDEs inspired more carefully or closely by the agent-based models. At first um, inspection, the resulting PDEs look wholly different from the phenomenological models, and yet we see good agreement between the numerical simulations. When we actually look in certain parameter regimes, we can sort of systematically um, show why we see this good agreement that the dominant balances in both, both models are actually the same at leading order. Um, and again, if you'd like, the details are explained much, much, much better than I've just done. Really, I've just tried to give you a flavour um, in the reference at the bottom of the slide there. So I guess um, I'll now move to the last bit of the talk. And really, this is, I guess, starting to grapple more with experimental data. But as a first step, really using synthetic networks to try to understand what we can learn. Um, so in order to get started, I guess a slight um, change of emphasis, if you think about these vessel networks that we've been simulating, they have a lot of structure. Um, we see loops through which blood can flow. Uh, we see capillary tips. And people have analyzed or extracted, characterized vessel networks um, using a variety of statistical metrics. For example, average vessel length or segment length, number of tips, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they're all sort of scalar quantities and they don't really say anything very much about the structural topology of the networks. So what we wanted to do was try to see whether or not, if we can characterize the topology of the network, whether that, how informative that might be and how the topology, whether if you give me a network, I can characterize its topology and learn something about um, what mechanisms are driving the formation of that network. So that's sort of our goal with this, with this work. Um, so in order to kind of explain what we've done, I've just um, a very quick um, introduction to persistent homology and barcodes. So the very simple idea here is 
imagine you have a point cloud. So all of these dots on a 2D plane. What we can do in order, so the naked eye will see, roughly speaking, two loops, one larger than the other in that data. What we can do is on each of the dots in our point cloud, you can put a little ball, you can inflate the radius of that ball. And obviously, as the radius increases in size, so you can think of the horizontal axis here as being the radius of the ball centered on each dot. So as the radius increases, eventually some of these disks are going to overlap. When a disk overlaps, then we say, so um, these two um, components fuse together and no, we have one connected component rather than two isolated components. And as we increase the radius further, then you will see more of these components um, fusing together. And when a component fuses with another, that bar ends and you can see it will join with another bar. Right now, eventually, over time, what you'll see happening as we increase the um, size of the balls centered on each point, you'll see loops forming. So here, the radius, all of these disks are overlapping. And so you see the emergence of a loop. And as the radius increases, eventually that loop gets covered over. And so the loop that's associated, the bar that's associated with it. So blue bars here are indicating loops. So that's when the smaller loop is created. And then the loop ends or the bar ends when the, the radius reaches a certain size that, that it's covered over. And so essentially what we're generating here is a barcode that summarizes this point cloud. And once you understand how to interpret it, it's quite intuitive. So the red lines are telling you how many connected components there are. That's Betty, Betty number zero. And the blue components are telling you how many loops there are. And what we can do is, because if we want to compare networks, we have to find a way to convert that barcode into some sort of um, vector or matrix or whatever. And one way in which to do that is to convert this persistence barcode into a diagram. And so this is our radius here. And this is when each um, feature is created. So the red dots correspond to connected components. And um, they're created at zero because they're there at the outset. And we put a mark when they die. So one bar is one connected component persists for this long. Um, and then the one up at the top here is the final connected component when all of the dots are connected together. And likewise, you can see this represents the smaller loop and the blue dot here represents the larger loop. So you can use these to um, essentially come up with a summary of a point cloud, which gives us details, multi-scale information about the structure that's inherent in, in that data. And so the idea is, can we apply similar sort of analysis to our vascular networks? So just to sort of summarize what we did then was we took um, not quite the same as the, the phenomenological model that I presented before, but very similar. And we generated synthetic data. And then what we did was we extracted from lots and lots of networks generated for different values of um, chemotaxis response to a chemical, diffusible chemical, also haptotaxis, which is response to um, a, chemi um, a chemical that's bound to the tissue matrix on which the cells are migrating. So rho and chi are two control parameters that we vary we generate lots and lots of different networks, and then we analyze those networks. We pull out a whole host of different descriptors. Some of those are standard statistical ones, for example, the numbers of tips, the numbers of vessel segments, how far the network has penetrated across our domain. But we complement those standard descriptors with topological descriptors. Um, and I guess the ones that I really want to concentrate on here are the two Betty numbers, Betty zero, which is the number of connected components, and Betty one, which is the number of loops. And then we can take 
those summary statistics and use those to um, essentially do cluster analysis um, as we analyze the networks for across the different parameter values that we've used. And we can compare um, the ability of the different descriptors, whether we use the standard ones or the topological ones, how well those can cluster the networks that we see. Um, and I guess probably in the interest of time, I will just probably um, go through and um, sort of um, cut to the chase. Um, sorry, actually, let me just talk you through this um, slide. So the way in which we generate the topological descriptors, so we generate a synthetic network. And what we do is we rather than having um, balls of in inflating balls around um, points, as we saw in the point cloud, what we're going to do with our 2D vas vascular networks is we're going to take a plane and sweep it across the network. And we might sweep it from left to right. We might sweep it from right to left, top to bottom, bottom to top. And as we do that for a network of a given, at a given time point, then we can compute how as you move that plane, the numbers of connected components and the numbers of loops to the, the left or right or top or bottom of the plane that you're sweeping across the network. And um, the sort of um, results here just show how, as we change the parameters that we use to generate the network, you can see the morphology is quite different. Um, and that's reflected in, in the um, Betty numbers that we see as we sweep across um, the networks. So if we take all of that data and we did a lot of computations comparing the standard descriptors, the topological descriptors, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what we found just sort of um, cutting to um, the chase is no single descriptor vector was able to cluster the simulated data into distinct groups that we could sort of interpret biologically. So the synthetic networks that we generated differed in these two parameters, the strength, the sensitivity to haptotaxis and the chemotaxis sensitivity. So what we did instead was rather than using single descriptors, we used double descriptors. So we took pairs of, say, um, left to right, top to bottom, et cetera, different combinations or use statistical plus et cetera. And what we found was that the most discriminatory was when we used um, a left to right sweeping plane and a right to left sweeping plane. And then we found that we could partition the data into five different clusters um, according to the values. And those sort of aligned very well with the parameter values that we used to generate those networks. And hopefully coming up here, just to sort of make that a little bit more real, is just a principal component analysis, sort of doing a projection of the topological descriptors that we use that show you how those synthetic data cluster into different groups. So that corresponds to the parameter values that we use. So you can see that we are indeed able quite nicely to cluster the data based on the topological um, structure of the networks. And that seems to map very nicely onto the parameter values that we use to generate those networks. And the panel on the bottom right is just showing you how for um, this combination of descriptors, how as you, um, why we chose, I guess, five clusters here, you can see how the out of sample accuracy is changing as we increase the number of clusters. Um, and then this just gives you an idea about of typical networks in each of those different groups. Um, now, just very finally, um, so we've also um, recently tried to apply or applied the same sort of approach to real biological data. So we've taken, so up until now, all of the um, models, 
and synthetic data that I talked about have really been 2D um, simulations. Uh, we were very lucky to have access to beautiful 3D imaging data from a couple of different imaging intravital data where we can, um, so we see the tumor inside a mouse and you can follow how that tumor grows over time and we can get beautifully detailed information of how the vascular network within the tumor, how that changes over time in the same animal. We also have other data, which is ultramicroscopy data, which is very detailed across the whole volume of the tumour, but only at a single time point. And this slide here just gives you an example, an idea of what these vessel networks look like. Um, and so what we did was um, try to um, apply similar techniques, except this, this time extended to 3D. And I guess the challenge here was to know what was the right filtration, how to sweep through this data. And we spent a lot of time thinking and worrying about this. And what we found that worked very nicely was what we call a radial filtration. So we, um, if you like, we, we start at the center of mass of our vascular network and we inflate a ball outwards and we look at how many connected components and loops, et cetera, we see as we expand that radius outward to um, encompass more of the network. And um, as we do that, we construct our barcodes for Betty zero, numbers of connected components, numbers of loops. Additionally, because we're living in 3D, we can also capture higher order structures or voids, which you can think of as regions that are devoid of blood vessels. So we kind of get a bit of extra information here. And um, what we did was apply this to um, a number of different vascular networks with different sorts of treatments. And I guess this is just some of the results that we observed. And again, long story short, what we found was that our topological descriptors were able to reproduce trends as you might expect for different types of treatments. So just to um, indicate if you perhaps focus on the numbers of loops here in this panel. So um, control untreated tumors, DC 101 is a treatment that inhibits angiogenesis. So as you expect over time, what we see relative to control is a reduction in the numbers of loops. Uh, DLL4 is um, an, a, um, a vessel targeting agent that promotes angiogenesis. And again, you can see that the um, topological data analysis is able to recover the same trends. Um, and then again, um, new insight that we were able to generate was, so there's sort of lot of interest in trying to understand when you irradiate a tumor, how does that, does it impact the, the vasculature, the blood vessel network? And so we were able to apply the same analysis to look at um, tumors which had been um, given just one large dose of irradiation or fractionated irradiation. And you can see how the numbers of loops and or um, the tortuosity of those vessels, how wiggly they are, how those change in response to um, different types of radiotherapy. So again, this is just, I think, the first time that people have been able to quantify the impact of radiotherapy on the vasculature in this way. OK, I think that's probably more than enough for one day. Um, so what I've tried to do is really take you through a range of different ways that we can try to analyze and understand the way in which vascular networks are formed, um, going very much from phenomenological models to where we are at the moment, where we're really trying to quantify and compare uh, vascular networks, 3D vascular networks using um, uh, in vivo experimental data. Um, I guess um, before I end, I should acknowledge the people who really did the work. Um, so Samara, Duncan, Bernadette and John, I think, um, are the main contributors to the different pieces of work. A couple of references there. And just thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you. And sorry if I've gone on a bit. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for such a nice talk. Um, now, please feel free to ask Helen questions if you have any. <clears throat> sorry, I know that was quite a lot to take in. That, that's that's true. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. I had one question I wanted to ask yeah. about. You mentioned, so in, in the beginning, you showed some examples of typical uh, typical cases where you had either successful vas vascularization or failed vascularization. Yeah. Could you say a few words about the transition of between those two and how the transition differs depending on whether you use uh, this agent-based or coarse-grained or the original phenomenological model? Um, so I must say that's not really something, um, I mean, if you go back and look at the phenomenological model, then um, the analysis, very simple analysis that we did gives you a hint as to how different mechanisms contribute. So essentially that phenomenological model is useful in terms of essentially it reduces the system to a 1D hyperbolic PDE. And you can see various different processes wrapped up in those terms. And so what you can see is, for example, reducing chemotaxis or reducing, you can see the trade-offs between different mechanisms, how one would promote and how one, so this I think is useful in giving you that sort of qualitative insight um, I haven't actually done a comparison, but it's a good question between um, that and, say, the ABM and the other PDE model. Haven't looked at that, but I think that's a good thing to do. Um, and I guess, um, in a sense, your question sort of highlights um, the pros and cons of different modelling approaches. So a very simple model can kind of make some of those relationships very transparent um, just with some sort of like, I don't know, undergraduate maths. Uh, with the more sophisticated models, it's all a little bit more um, intricate. It's less transparent. So you, you have trade-offs with the different um, modeling approaches that you use, which in a sense is why it's actually nice, I think, to have multiple models of the same system. Thank you. Okay. I think everyone must be a bit tired or hungry. <laughs> oh, we have. Hey, uh, so I just had a question that's maybe more broadly on uh, topological data analysis. Yep. But one thing I've I've noticed when I see those kind of barcode graphs yeah. is that you measure, so you have these connected uh, points and then the very next thing you measure is the Betty number one loops, right? Yeah. Um, but there's no measurement of when edges appear individually. Is that something that's interesting or is there a reason it's uninteresting? Like it, it seemed like in between these kind of components disappearing, we also have the creation of edges before a loop is ever made. Um, um, maybe I don't fully understand you. So, so when you say an edge, mm -hmm. um, is it clear on this picture? Uh, you don't have one drawn, but like, for example, in figure B uh, on the Yes, yeah. I mean, any any overlapping yellow circles would create yeah. an edge uh, yes. in, in my head. Um, but there's no loop yet. And yet there's nothing measuring the fact that an edge was created. And I'm wondering if there's a reason well, why edges are uninteresting. There is, there, there is in the sense that you you lost lost a connected component. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that's the best that you get. Mm -hmm. That's where it's captured, I guess. I don't know. I guess that makes sense. I guess there's a there's a difference between something that already has an edge gaining a new edge, if that makes sense. Like if uh, if three circles are merging to give you two edges, or whether you have two pairs of points merging, but, both would but give you I guess two that edges. Would, but... that, that would be reflected in your barcode because you would either lose, just lose, you you you'd kind of 
um, lose one of your connected components or you'd form a loop. I see. I think, I think that's correct. So a loop will form where, so if you had three connected components, you will have a loop if they, they can each overlap pairwise, but there has to be a hole in the middle. Ah, uh, okay. See what I mean? Maybe I, yeah. I perhaps no, didn't no, explain that, that, that carefully enough. It, no, that actually, that does make sense. So like the combination of, of loops and connected yes. components gives you edges, edges implicitly. So you actually haven't lost information. No. Okay, that's no. interesting. Thanks. Good, thank you. I, uh, thanks. Thanks for the really nice talk. And I ask a quick question about the uh, TDA at the end, the kind of the grouping yep. of the different um, kind of clouds. So I guess my question was, you, you, you. It's, yeah, it's a little bit further on. Yeah, it's that one. It's thirty-seven, I think. Are, are yep. these qualitatively different regimes or just different parameter regimes? Uh, they are qualitatively different. So if you look on this slide here. Um, so what we've done is just taken a representative from cluster one, two, three, four, five. So mm -hmm. it, you can see how qualitative visually they are quite different. So uh, the different clusters correspond to, um, it turns out, um, different ranges of the chemotaxis and haptotaxis parameters that we use to generate rate them. Mm. Um, um, so uh, in particular, I guess cluster one is weak chemotaxis, very strong haptotaxis. The vessels don't go very far. They look very sort of dense. Um, over in group five, things are sort of zipping along, not very many loops, as many, but very long, I guess. So you can see qualitative differences and they do I mean, I was quite surprised that we were able to do this, that it worked so nicely. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Right. Good. Do we have any other questions for Helen? All right, I guess we will just wrap up here for today. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker, Helen, again, and everyone for participating. I will see you next time and have a nice day, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Take care.